There are all types of roads to various positions and higher education administration is no different. Many people enter their positions from different doors and from different professional trajectories. So welcome to the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston. And today we're gonna to talk about what it is like to enter higher education administration from a scholarly background. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. And today we have Dr. Dina Gonzalez as our guest. Dr. Dina Gonzalez is the Provost and Senior Vice President of Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. Uh, she became the Provost and Senior Vice President in June 2019. She is Gonzaga's Chief Academic Officer overseeing the complete student experience, combining academic and student life. In collaboration with the university president, Dr. Gonzalez is responsible for the implementation of academic priorities for Gonzaga University to provide high quality education, educational programs within and outside of the classroom setting. She supports the strategic direction of the university by supporting the development of the whole person, intellectually, spiritually, culturally, physically and emotionally. She was born and raised in New Mexico, a 14th, let me repeat, 14th generation uh, uh, New Mexican. And she received her PhD in history from the University of California at Berkeley. She was the first Chicana to complete the program. She is co-founder of the native Chicana academic organization, MOX, Mujeres Activas in Letras y Cambio, Cambio Social, a mentor to several scholars of the U.S. West, and a passionate teacher and scholar. Dr. Gonzalez is the author of the Spanish Mexican Women of Santa Fe and of two major encyclopedia projects, which are both from Oxford University Press. And she has published over 15 journal articles, book chapters, and working papers, as well as the first and only book series exploring the lives, histories, and experiences of Mexican origin women, Chicana Matters. Dr. Gonzalez was recently named one of the 50 most important living women historians in the United States by the Sophia Smith Radliff Harvard Project, and she was honored at a special session of the Organization of American Historians in, in Philadelphia earlier this year for her work in mentoring historians. Congratulations. Prior to coming to Gonzales, Dr. Gon Gon Gonzaga, excuse me, Dr. Gonzalez served in a number of roles at Lo Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, chair of the Department of Chicana y Chicano Studies, director of faculty development, and associate provost of faculty affairs. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dina Gonzalez. How are you today? I am so fine, Dr. Houston. It's great to see you again after these number of years where we've intersected at various conferences, uh, dating back now several decades almost. I hate to I hate to age us, but uh, <laughs> we do we do go back. And of course, I followed your work and uh, think very highly of it. Uh, but I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so happy you're here. Um, just to tell our audience just a little bit about our, our history, we met when we have a long history. Uh, to refresh your memory, uh, I don't know if you remember, but we actually met when I was in undergrad, and I was there was a graduate uh, program out of the University of Florida at yes. Gainesville. Okay. that was tr was trying to get uh, young African-American scholars to consider pursuing um, graduate studies in history. Mm -hmm. And you were our guest, um, you were like a guest scholar. I don't know what they ca called you, but were you in under, I mean, were you in graduate school at that time? No, I had, 
I think I had finished, I started my first job at Pomona College, and I think that was the national faculty, but you're probably also remembering that I hadn't yet finished my PhD. So I was, I was mm. in a position as an instructor and then got into the assistant professor ranks as soon as the PhD was completed. So I think it was one of those summers where I was right in between and that was so exciting. I just remember it pouring rain <laughs> in games. <laughs> but I also remember that that group of students, oh my gosh, I learned so much. It yeah, there were like, like, yes, there were like 11 or 12 of us. Yeah. And that was early in your career. And now yeah. you have, you've just become this, you know, renowned historian and scholar of Chicana and Chicano studies and American history. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I, you know, I've been keeping up with you. I'm delighted to, <laughs> that you, uh, we have this relationship and we have this history. And so I'm really excited about having you here. Um particularly when we try, when we work, excuse me, not try, when we work to center the histories of people of color, particularly African-Americans and Mexican-Americans, Chicana, Chicano-Americans uh, in, um, in the study and preservation of American history. So uh, before we get started on your topic uh, today about how you entered higher administration as a scholar and what advice you would give people who are interested in higher education administration. Um, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your background and, you know, personally and professionally, well, how did you get interested in studying history and New Mexico 14th generation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, much of your background and because everybody has their own story of how they got to where they are. No, I think it's, um, it, it, it's a very important part to of, um, how we not only tell history, create history, make history, but you know, just think about it. Um, more generally and broadly. Um, and, and we know there's a trend toward um, thinking ahistorically or thinking with limited historical knowledge. So, so many of our students will say, I'm shocked I didn't know about this Tulsa neighborhood mm -hmm. that was a full-fledged you know, African-American business community and so on, and it was burnt to the ground. And those incidents just litter the whole, um, the whole of history. Mm -hmm. But um, coming from New Mexico, you know, there's just such a focus here on uh, people's past and who you are and how you're connected uh, through families and other kinds of networks. And so I, I think I've, I've always carried with me some, not only curiosity, but, but some sort of sense that there, there's something special. Um, and of course, when I meet people from other regions of the country, they feel their region of the country special as well. And so it has helped me as an historian to kind of take that motivation or passion that I think was inculcated very early on by grandparents who told stories, oral histories and traditions in the family, and then by my mother who really did love history. Um, she was a teacher, she was a principal, she was very involved in education in New Mexico. And I think always felt that we would be um, similarly drawn into, um, you know, thinking about the past, but also thinking about the present in um, questions of access and equity. And, and those are things, you know, that again, have been with us for many decades and several centuries even. Um, New Mexico had a, a, a group of people that were teachers and educators almost since the mid 19th century. And so after the United States um, colonized or conquered these territories of the West, um, people who had any kind of specialization and ability were active, became pretty active educators um, because there were such limitations on uh, Mexican and Spanish Mexican kids, you know, participating in any kind of educational system. So I think equity and access were kind of embedded in, in, in that same history. Um, and it certainly motivated me to think about uh, not only what I was doing as an undergraduate interested in history and anthropology, 
but also um, it, while at Berkeley, having access to the kinds of archives that were so rich in details about people who hadn't been viewed or studied in the past. Women, for example, uh, who are just literally all over the archival record, but you haven't had people interested in the lives of women or the issues and challenges. And so that's one thing that really did motivate me. And I had mentors at Berkeley who said, go for it, do it. We don't think you're going to find very much. And then we're shocked. <laughs> you know, when I came back with about 10 boxes of stuff saying I've been in New Mexico on this fellowship again and look at what I found and um, this is what I'm finding in the Bancroft Library and so on. And you know, what's exciting about that and I think what, I, what I'd like and, and, and what I think is important, especially for young people who are considering fields or areas of study or have a passion about something is that if you go where no one's gone before that is an incredibly exciting thing. And that doesn't just have to be done technologically speaking. Um, that is the games and you know all sorts of things that, that young people today are so drawn into. Uh, it can be done uh, through pretty dusty libraries and archives. And um, if you have any sleuthing interest at all, you know, then again, I would say uh, develop that and follow it because uh, going where people haven't gone before can be very lonely, um, just as higher ed administration, I think, can be very lonely. Um, and, and there aren't a lot of people of color in, in some of the leading positions. But I think that when you go there, that that's one of the most exciting, creative, innovative spaces you can occupy. And it will get you up in the morning and it will have, help you sleep at night, <laughs> which has which is good. <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, so what, you know, you talked about your scholarly background. What, um, what, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of several questions. Before we go into higher education administration, what advice do you give to uh, young women who want to study history? You know, we are still primarily a male dominated field. And then when you look at the frontier, if you will, of history, which is studying people of color, particularly uh, people of Latino descent, it has not been a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Not that there has been a lot of work from the African-American perspective, but one thing that we did have were historically black colleges and universities, which really paved the way for much of the studies uh, that have happened. So we, we have a rich history of creating this material at HBCUs uh, prior to the, a lot of people, African-American studies becoming a discipline. So what advice uh, and guidance would you give young scholars who are wanting to go into this field? Well, I'd say the door is wide open for you. Um, so you don't have to worry as much about being placed if you do pursue a higher degree. Many people in the field of history, as you know, we have five, 800 PhDs graduating every year from universities across the country. Now five to 800 doesn't sound like that many. You know, it doesn't sound like say having 5,000 teachers completing their education. But five to 800 historian trained uh, Grant PhD granted um, scholars, and and only maybe ten to twenty to thirty of those will receive a tenure track appointment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, most of them will be on in in jobs and positions that don't offer job security necessarily, or are not the jobs that they actually actively prepared for in their graduate programs. The key is that those who do specialize, for example, in Afro Latino relations or the African presence in, in Mexico or Latin America, or those who specialize, um, you know, a lot of our, uh, a number of my Latino colleagues have specialized in African history. So when you do something that creative, that is that you move outside your zone, but you are looking and thinking very, in, very much in innovative new ways of approaching material or even a field that's already established, I think you gain something, you gain a, a perspective, but you also gain a foothold in that area that others don't have. 
And and it and that's one of the most important contributions to you can, that you can make. It's kind of like what women did when they said we're going to study the lives of women, whether people tell us they we should or tell us that we can't, we're going to do it. And I think that what happened with women historians is that now uh, very few history departments, for example, ignore the experience of women in history, in US, US history or European history or Asian um, and Latin American histories. Very, very few departments can ignore that. Um, and so I think that, again, creating that opportunity for yourself and the training that goes with it is, is absolutely critical. Um, the other, of course, is language. You know, we know that, that if you, if you can be bi and trilingual, um, you are just aided enormously in studying any of the humanities or any of the social science fields uh, because uh, there's so few. I mean, in 9-11, we learned this. Mm -hmm. uh, the State Department had 25 uh, relatively fluent Arab-speaking U.S citizens working there 25 when it needed probably you know 2500 really mm -hmm. <laughs> so again if you look if you you kind of think about um the connection between what is present and and available but also about where your own kind of um interests and inventiveness and curiosity lie i think you'll have a much a richer opportunity to really move through um, a number of these kind of areas that are more closed and that require so much more specialization, um, which, you know, a, a faculty position, a professorship, teaching generally requires one to be a specialist in something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So let's talk about you going into higher, admin, uh, higher education administration. Um, congratulations on your new role. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to hear about um, what it's like, your topic, what it's like to go into higher edu education administration from a scholarly background and, uh, you know, what you add to the uh, perspective of developing higher education institution and just your advice on how we can get more um, people of color, particularly African-Americans and Lat Latino, Latina Americans, Mexican, Mexica, Mexican Americans into higher education administration. I know the job opportunities are now becoming more available now that people uh, the the institution has recognized the yes. value that we bring to the table and that we have to uh, create opportunities for us to serve in those positions because we're moving toward educating um, more students of color and we need uh, educators who can really identify and help institutions um, in that process. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things too that I'm hearing you as you're, as you're asking the question and we're talking about the opportunities, but also the time that we're living in, mm -hmm. um, we hear a lot about, you know, especially from young people who say, why should I spend four years in the career classroom? Uh, or even if I'm online and remote um, book learning when what I really want to do is carpentry or I really want to be, you know, learn a trade. I want to be a plumber. I think you'd be a lot smarter, happier plumber if you did have, in fact, a college education of some sort, if you had courses um, where, where you really followed your passion in just about anything. I mean, it could be in engineering or science classes or in history and the humanities. And the reason that I say that is I think that, you, that one learns to think um, in some really interesting ways and when you're surrounded by your peers who are thinking as well, uh, there's a, a connection and an expansion, I think, of your mind, of your, of your processes that will last with you, that will stay with you for life. Um, it's not just though that higher level of thinking, it's not just abstract, conceptual, kind of analytical and interpretive skills that get developed. Those are all helpful and useful, 
But I also think that there's something really practical in earnings that we've seen. That is the higher degree you have, the more you're going to earn over the course of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty simple formula that in the U.S. continues to remain one of the markers of, of people's lives. In. It means, I think, then that access and equity are all the more important. And that's what really motivated me in terms of administration was the potential to be able to continue to um, shape decisions that allow more people to come in the door and to have access to higher education and to account for their special circumstances. So if you're a first generation or veteran, uh, you're a person of color, um, have not navigated necessarily the world of academics or you know school even, those opportunities I think should not be lost on that group, that population that is so large in our country and that has traditionally been ostracized and told you can't do it or your grades aren't good enough or you're not, you're really not college bound or graduate school material. Um, so, so one of the motives I've had has been that the other is that I really do believe that if equity, if we're going to, to distribute resources in this society, if we're going to have access to equity and, and, and really be able to make a change in the institutions of the society. So whether that's in the medical fields or health science fields, in the courts, in the legal profession, in education, you know, in all those arenas, politics, then the more education you have, the harder it is to be denied a place at the table. Uh, and that still, again, pertains. I mean, that is not something that, you know, you can make a billion dollars, but I'll tell you the one thing that people continue to talk about, Mark Zuckerberg about, is, is that he doesn't have a degree, he doesn't have a college degree. So um, as magnificent, and, and probably even as unnecessary as people think that would have been for him, that's an exception. It is not the main. Most of us do need college degrees and do need to train our minds in particular ways. And so I, I think of, of higher education as the portal, as the thing that is gonna let you through. Um, it isn't going to make you happy, it's not, we can't say you're going to be the happiest person on earth and the most joyful person because you are in higher education. Not the case. It's hard work. Um, it is demanding. It is full of expectation. And it's also full of prejudice and bias and discrimination. But I think that's even more the case. Let, you know, that reason, that's, that makes more the case for why we should go into that environment and and fix it and make it right um so the, the that's kind of my those, those have always been my motives i mean even as a graduate student and why i would get a degree um and i kind of just kicked myself up and along it's not like i said i want a job and i want to get tenure mm -hmm. and i want to be a professor and i want to be known and i want to publish i i didn't think about any of that but what I did think about was this is something I can do well and I'm happy when I'm doing it. And I also think that it helps other people because I could see you know, some of the changes and differences that were being made by virtue of having a voice and having a spot in, in the conversation. And you're so right. We do need to be at the table to help uh, create opportunities for people to go to college. You talked about first generation, you talked about people of color, you know, we have all these biases in, uh, in higher education that it many times keeps people out instead of welcoming people in. So um, what, how do you think that people of color can better serve in higher education administration? What do you think our roles and responsibilities should be? Well, I think, you know, again, the, the, I think being prepared for the difficulty of the work matters. So some training um, is always important. That is, there are now a number of programs that are looking to diversify 
and to bring in. And so the way that prior generations, I think, could function with that level who were presidents or provosts or deans um, was to just kind of be promoted from within and move forward. But even they now will say now, if, if you can take it, advantage of a training program that is helpful in that establishing a network. And as we know, you know, as you've spoken about in, in some of your other podcasts with your other visitors, having that network and strategizing is extremely important, especially for women of color. Um, I think for me, the American Council on Education Fellowship Year meant a lot because what it did was it took me out of my comfort zone as an associate provost for faculty affairs. And that was a job that I loved. I could do that job in my sleep. You know, I knew if it was this week, I should be doing this activity or event. I, it kept me very, very close to the faculty in a very particular way. And also even to students, I was able to teach a class every once in a while. And so I didn't lose track or sight of that. Being a pro was a whole different thing because the area of responsibility is so much larger. Um, and, and, and there's a reliance um, on a number of people um, who are in charge of and control of areas that um, you're not just sort of on your own. And when you're a faculty member, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're the, the queen of your classroom. You, know? <laughs> you run that <laughs> show. When you're a department chair, you're the head of that department and you, you know, you pretty much do it. Uh, but when you're a provost, it's like you're kind of responsive to everyone and responsible to everyone, but not really um, any one particular group. And so it's a much more disparate kind of uh, job in terms of size, in terms of expectations, in terms of composition even of, of tasks and responsibilities. And I enjoy doing the, the work. I really, you know, I've derived, I think a lot of good, um, learning experiences from it. I'm always learning, but I don't think that I'm necessarily either a typical provost. So, you know, typical provost can be pretty uh, cold and to the point, you know, and so it's kind of, you're in for five minutes and then out. I tend not to be, because of my training, my background, you know, as a professor, as a faculty member, but also I think as a person of color, I just can't do that. You know, I, I, I don't, and of course, everyone advises me, people advise me and say, well, could you do a little bit of it so that you're not just in one hour meetings all the time, you're in 15 minute meetings or half an hour meetings. Um, I think if we're going to change institutions and make them more whole, holistic and make them more humane, then we've got to take the time to, to really kind of be authentically and fully ourselves. And, and you know, positions in higher education still don't necessarily lend themselves to that approach. Um, I think because, for example, now we have many, many more African-American presidents and chancellors, and including women um, who really are just uh, outstanding, you know, in, in their preparation, in their elegance, in their ability, you know, to just kind of motivate and, and move things. I think those examples are really critical because it will help and encourage others. I think on the Latino side of things in the United States, we're still kind of at the, at the very basic level of just trying to get into higher ed. And because our population, our demographic is going to occupy the largest student population in the country very soon, you know, another 15 years, it's not gonna be one out of every five, it's gonna be more like two mm -hmm. or three out of every five college-bound student is going to be Latino or Latina just because of our numbers. And I think that's going to make for a really interesting time. So part of what I do now and think about a little bit is how am I paving the way and helping things here so that when someone does step in, uh, they're not the first, they're not like the mm -hmm. only one. Um, mm -hmm. And they really do feel like they have a, 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 a history and a, a real uh, embeddedness in the institution. They have a kind of institutional richness and knowledge that I think for, for especially many Latinos is still missing. And you know, you referenced the HBCUs, um, which I think were so incredibly important. But I also think that, you know, African-American culture in the US 
is is U.S. culture, and U.S. culture is African American culture, mm-hmm. and that's something you know that Latinos and Latinas don't necessarily have in that same way. Uh, I think it's American culture; it's of the Americas, but I think that's a whole different level of, of thinking. And to my mind, that that learning learning about those differences, learning and and thinking through what it means is absolutely important. Um, I think it's a way that we can help one another and really advance and and ensure that um, people, you know, are not being overlooked or denied access, um, not just on the basis of who they are uh, ethnically or racially or culturally, or, or, or even in terms of their sexuality and their class, but are really being viewed, you know, in ways that say you have you have a very particular place and placement in this country, in this society, and that placement deserves to be known and to be that story of yours deserves to be told. Um, so I think we're all moving toward that. I mean, television, you know, movies can't kind of get enough of this. You know, they're really all trying to get at the, the particular story. And I think there's a reason for it, but similarly higher ed is, is working in that direction. You said so many great things in, in, uh, in everything you just stated right now, but one of the things I wanna highlight is the importance of leaders coming in and being their authentic selves. Like when we come into these institutions Many times we end up changing ourselves, right, to fit in. And when in actuality, we need to come in authentically and change the culture of the institution to appreciate uh, your difference and how your difference enhances the institution versus takes away from the institution. And I think that as administrators in higher education, since there are so few of us right now, Mm -hmm. um, that sometimes we feel uncomfortable with that, but we need to be authentic in order, like you said, so other people who come after us will feel they can be authentic too. Mm -hmm. And there is something very valuable about bringing your whole authentic self to the table um, versus coming in as somebody that you're not. And I think that's one of the most difficult things that I notice, especially women of color, we struggle a lot with that because sometimes we just want to say what it is. You know, we just want to throw up our hands and say, okay, folks, let's go back to the beginning. And 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 in academia, you can't really talk that way a lot. <laughs> there, there are very few safe zones, you know, where, where you can kind of let your hair down, kind of practice, say these things. And yet there are the places when you think, I think about it, I think, you know, those are the most creative places we can be um, with one another. And so I think kind of doing both, we're all bicultural and bilingual, you know, we all move between this Mm -hmm. sort of mainstream, male stream Mm -hmm. approach that is is such such a formula for an institution and, and then bringing in that which is different and contrary and in some ways more life-giving and richer, I think, than, than some of those other forms. And we bring in our, uh, emo- a range of emotions that are also simply not part of academic um, mm-hmm. involvement. So I think that, you know, I think there are ways to do it, but I also see us sometimes getting into a lot of trouble because we don't judge or evaluate correctly. I, I, I find myself feeling this way, you know, many times where I think, oh my gosh, I didn't read that one correctly. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me start again. Um, and then, you know, even, even when people say, and I still can be kind of, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's naive, but I can still kind of think when someone says, I really want you to be yourself. Um, in an academic setting, but they really mean it. And ha- much of the time they don't. I mean, if they really saw me authentically, they'd get scared and 
you know, kind of run the other way, or they would not appreciate fully because they're not, their ears aren't trained. Their head and mind isn't trained to accept, you know, some of the complexities. Um, and, and we who operate, you know, at the level of kind of cultural difference or cultural exchange or interculturalism or biculturalism, we're kind of used to that. We're kind of used to, ah, okay, let me, let me then do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but many settings in academic, in, especially academia, I think are not about that. They're pretty rigid and, and pretty established. And so that's one skill I think that, that one learns. Um, and then, you know, I think if you're a president, um, I imagine this, I don't know, I've never been a president, but if you're a president, then I think, you know, it's like, well, whatever you say goes. <laughs> you know, so then maybe you can be authentically yourself. I don't know, <laughs> uh, fully, fully yourself. <laughs> so how do you think your movement into uh, higher education administration has been different since you've come from an academic background? How's that different from other uh, people's experiences? Well, I think especially contemporarily, there are many more programs now and degrees in higher education mm -hmm. administration that people mm -hmm. see that go into them. Um, I My route was a little, again, different because I, I came through it uh, through my discipline, through my mm -hmm. area of study as a teacher scholar in, in many respects. And some people just don't have that background. So there's, they have familiarity with the faculty, they have familiarity with scholarship, they have familiarity with how you kind of do things, but they're not really of that group. They're not of the faculty. They haven't been in classrooms, you know, actively teaching, you know, three, four, or five classes a semester or teaching 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 students, or if you teach at a UCLA, 250 students, you know, in a class. So there's not a sense or sensitivity about what that means. And I think that coming from that perspective gives you um, a, a kind of inkling about how the decisions you're making might shape someone's life in mm -hmm. a <laughs> mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. different way. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's helpful but um, you know, we know that higher education administration can be divided into lots of different camps. Mm -hmm. You know, where you are in the hierarchy matters a lot. Um, what you do in those positions matters a lot. If you're inclined and you want to kind of get somewhere, I see a lot of people just kind of being very safe, you know, playing things very safely because they want to go on to the next step. And they feel that if they do say something that's contrary or they do say something that's different from the opinion that's being rendered, they may suffer for, for it. And so there are a lot of dynamics at play in this sort of, you know, in the jobs, in the um, positions that we take in higher ed. And I think having some sense of that before you go into one makes a huge difference. Um, you know, just listen, listening to you uh, talk about coming from a teacher scholar perspective in higher education administration, um, even though you implied this, I think it's specifically that you're more student centered. Like a lot of these people come in from, you know, like you said, these higher education programs, not having been in the classroom, faculty we know are the foundation of any institution. When everybody else is go, gone, faculty always stay the same. Students leave, administrators leave, you know, alumni are already, you know, outside of the institution. The board comes from all different facets of society or, or of the community, but faculty are there. They are the foundation. And when you come from that background, you're more sensitive to being student-centered and really being sensitive to the issues and concerns of faculty. I think it's a really good and important point. And that's what faculty will tell you when they're on search committees for some of these positions and they're evaluating candidates. They'll say, who's going to be an advocate for us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's always that kind of champion us who's going to uh, do this. And of course, when you're on this other side, you have to see the whole scale of things. So it isn't just faculty, it's students, it's a staff as well. 
You have to be really knowledgeable about the needs of staff and so on. So I think that we have, um, there are a number of opportunities uh, to learn about an environment or an institution, but where you derive or originate does matter. And mm -hmm. I mean, the opportunity might be given to you because you are in fact from the faculty and that's what was most at play. Um, for some others, it might be you came from a position of being an accreditation expert, an assessment expert, or student affairs expert. That's what was needed at that time in the institution. Um, so I think there's an enormous amount of flexibility now in evaluating candidates and, and for positions in higher ed. And there's such enormous turnover, particularly with now with post COVID, we're seeing you know, shelf life. Most provosts don't make it to year five. That is, and I don't mean make it, they actually actively remove themselves before the fifth year and they go on to other kinds of positions. It didn't used to be the case. The academic vice president or the dean of the faculty used to last 10 years. A president, presidents used to always yes, be a decade, decade, two decades, <laughs> three decades, I mean, forever. Not now. Why do you think? Well, I think the challenges of the job are so, so harsh and there is so much litigation and grievance and so much um, attention paid to those things that probably one didn't even consider before taking the position that you know about it, but you don't think all my day is going to be spent with legal counsel today or all my day is going to be spent on Title IX or um, you know, discrimination or harassment, or all my day is going to be spent on a dysfunctional department that really does need some major facilitation and, and mediation. And we know any one of those things, I kind of myself going into the position knew that it would be the case that, you know, I need to be prepared and conversant and kind of aware that these sort of things happen, but I think the expectation is that that's not going to dominate in, in the position for a president or a provost. And I think in many institutions, it becomes the dominant mm -hmm. factor in the future mm -hmm. of your working life. Um, there's also the fact that you don't ever have any time off. You know, you just, it's a 65 hour week job and people talk about work-life balance. Oh, you shouldn't do that to yourself. Oh, you should just, you know. <laughs> Um, reduce the number of hours, just don't answer the email right away. Well, you could do that, but then there's going to be one day or one evening where you're going to be facing four very critical and important emails all at once, <laughs> you know, and with the capacity in your brain of thinking two or three of them and, and lamenting, why didn't I just do this at seven in the morning or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew now or, or whatever. Um, the job is, the jobs are big. They're just really kind of overwhelming and, and large in a way that they were not before. Um, and the technology has not helped us because the technology <laughs> actually has made us feel like we're much more efficient. So mm -hmm. going, 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 as opposed to a technology that made us and forced us to kind of take stock and mm -hmm. stop, have real dinner, go out with colleagues, you know, mm -hmm. and have a life that lets you maybe talk about work, but that also you get to talk about other things, you know, mm -hmm. that are important to people. So those opportunities are pretty few and far between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciate uh, you coming on the show. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm sure that uh, our audience, uh, would like to hear what advice, what specific calls to action would you give our audience for those members who are real members of our audience who are really, really interested in pursuing higher education administration or, well, I, or, 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 or uh, being a professor, what, or a being professor, a professor, scholar. Yes. I, I get ready, train, I'd say, be curious and, and really push yourself into those places where you may find a mentor, where you'll find some um, solid examples of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Search for those programs and those people. 
people are very willing to share. I mean, you, any one of us, any person you call or write to, if, if we can't do it, we'll find someone who can because we're still so few in number. Um, and I think that those, you know, you don't have to follow every piece of advice that you hear, but I think integrating some of those pieces of advice can really be helpful to your career. Uh, to your opportunity to kind of um, making a difference, you know, and and really truly, I think educators do make a huge difference in the society. It's unfortunate that educators are not rewarded monetarily or financially in the way that one would expect. Um, but I think that you don't go into these professions thinking um, about that. You, you, you know, you. You will have financial security if you stay in the profession, but it isn't um, a money maker. And so I think that's what discourages a number of young people. And I would just say to young people, you know, the, the money really doesn't mean much. Um, you're not taking it with you when we expire, when our days are over on this earth. Um, but people will remember your impact. They will remember you know, what, what you said and, and in the impact you had on others. And so I would say that, again, if you're interested in helping others, if you're interested in some of the problems, the key problems of this society, train up, train up. Um, it's not unlike what athletes do. You know, if you want to win Wimbledon, you are gonna, you're going to work really, really hard, um, you know, because that's your goal. And that's your ambition. And uh, well, certainly you can do it, but you are going to have to work really hard and put up with a lot. Great advice. So if any of our, uh, it's excellent advice, prepare, get a mentor, uh, get advice, get it and leave what other advice you don't need off the table. <laughs> Think about your purpose and your impact. It's not always about money, but it's about how you uh, how you make a difference in the lives of others and train up. You always have to get your skills and talents, knowledge and abilities much better. Thank you so much for that advice. Uh, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, how would they contact you, Dr. Gonzalez? So one of the things they could do is Google provost at Gonzaga University or provost Gonzaga University. And that will take you to my website, but also to my particular link on the website, which is the provost email. Um, that email gets read by uh, my executive assistant, uh, Marianne Ringerly, and, uh, and by myself. So it depends on who of us gets there first. <laughs> but that will, that will be helpful because then we also have a way of keeping track of whether I've responded or not. And I certainly do like to respond. So I'm more than happy to continue the conversation in whatever way works for, for your listeners. So next is our segment on strategies for college success. Uh, so Dr. Dina Gonzalez, I know you have plenty of great advice uh, for students to inspire them on uh, strategies for college success. So what is what would you tell students? You know, I think the most important thing, and this is going to sound so basic. I mean, I think some of your listeners, especially some of the younger ones will appreciate this, but um, I, I look back on my days of what, what really helped me and I understand we're in a different generation. I understand we have technology that's just so different from back then, where there was a television set in black and white that had two <laughs> channels with CBS, ABC, NBC, and sometimes they didn't come in very well. You had to go out and get the antenna or whatever. And I mean, we're talking really, really primitive conditions. I'm talking about dial up telephones that would be clunky. I, so, all of that, keeping in mind. Here's the thing that I think really, really inspired uh, me and kept me motivated. And that was um, comic books, mm. reading, just reading anything. Um, even, mm -hmm. even those little teenage novels when I was 12, 11, 12, 13, those paperback novels you would find in various places, sometimes used bookstores reading matters enormously. And I think that the more you read and, and spend time, 
to the point where you feel uncomfortable if you have not read on any given day. Mm -hmm. Before you go to bed, you kind of feel like, oh, what's this? Thing? Ah, I don't think I read a newspaper. I don't think I looked at something. I should read something. Um, I think that's one of the most important things you can do. And if you're missing out in school and someone is telling you, you could do better, you're not doing enough, you're not doing well, you really, you know, are kind of lagging, get to reading, read something. Again, even if it's a stack of comic books, if whatever favorite you have, I think it trains your mind and brain in a certain direction and it helps focus your attention in a way that movies do not, that plays do not, that poetry does not, that your artwork might not, your drawings, your renderings, your watercolors, your jogging, your running around a track or taking a hike, do not. Um, and, and I think it's a really important part of, of life in terms of preparation for everything that is to come. And once you're in that habit, it, it just makes it so much easier to face certain challenges. Um, and it's a skill. So um, it helps too if you surround yourself by people who read. So if you're missing something, think about maybe I can check into a library. <laughs> just to pick. Very unusual. <laughs> Libraries are empty these days. Everyone is in front of their computer or their mm -hmm. iPhone, mm -hmm. even when they're out in the park, you know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Duck into a library, duck into a bookstore, go into some place that where you see some, you see books or you see magazines, or even at the airport, you know, get into that uh, book section or magazine section. And it really matters very little what it, what matters is that you do it consistently. So. That is absolutely great advice. I, I think I always had told my students and people who want to go to college, read, read, read. If you can just begin, if, if, if your books at school, some people aren't even buying books now, but if, if they don't interest you, if you're reading biographies and autobiographies of people that you admire, right? If you're reading yeah. fiction, whatever you do, just read and, and explore your mind. It develops so many other skills um, that you would not believe, but most people don't recognize the importance of reading and how much it trains your mind. And families, I think, need to do that too, where you don't have the paper anymore, the newspaper, you know, sitting there that you used to have. Mm -hmm. hang around or open. Uh, instead, it's much easier to just mm -hmm. turn the television on and mm -hmm. or the computer and and you read in the, on the computer in a different way. You know, mm -hmm. you read things on the computer. Of course, you have access to so much more. But I think, again, people tend to be more flighty about reading mm -hmm. and not do kind of the deep dive. So I, I think so much of the time students would tell me, well, I read everything I could find on lions or tigers or something. Mm -hmm. And that curiosity that you had as a child, you know, about all of the world as a big place, I think if you sustain that, you know, it, it, it plays an enormous role in your own success as a human being in the success of your, in your career, in your success just as a person who can then be ready to help others. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that great advice. We really, really appreciate it. Make sure you read, read, read. Dr. Dina Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dr. Houston. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Gully, theme song. Nad Works, digital support. And of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.